I'm here with Wilhelm Sasnall at his exhibition at Sadie Cole's Gallery in London. And it's great to be out in the world again. Um, in fact, it feels kind of strange being in galleries surrounded by art. And um, it's almost as if we've forgotten how to do it and have to reacquaint ourselves with being in the world. And here's you looking at your son and his friend during lockdown. So they, they decided to meet. And that's the view from my studio. They were sitting on the grass. And the black shape is a, is a shadow of the studio. That's him and the three friends. Recently I was reading quite a lot about this, about his generation. How such a um, situation like, like lockdown or what may happen with uh, environmental crisis, how, how it's going to affect this generation. For me it was about his generation, how it's um, hopeless in these times. And of course being older, we're both parents, I'm a grandparent, I spend a lot of time feeling guilty, not for what I've done personally, perhaps, so much as what I've been complicit with, and with neo-capitalism. So do I, in a way. But on the other hand, somehow I, I feel that I'm, I'm so close still to this generation. I, I sympathize them with them so much that I, I sometimes even engage myself with their issues. So, I, I have the feeling I'm in between, because also in, in Poland, uh, the generation of my generation, ones who remember communists and who were getting into uh, adolescence during the changes, during the turn of the 80s and 90s, that was the generation that, that got a lot of profits of these changes. And so, so there is a there is certain vacuum. To what degree do you think your work is... Um influenced by that change, that having been born into communism and the changes through your adolescence and so on? A lot, I think. When I was adolescent, I missed a lot of this openness to the Western world. But basically, I was, I was really in between. My generation was, was really in between the Western world and, uh, and the world of communist bloc. And I think this the influence the memory of this of this period before the 89 is crucial if I have the right to say so but I think my generation is not cynical um, I think we are really EU believers believing in what European Union and this this the, the openness of the of of the world strangely some of the paintings here seem to say the opposite you know, there's a barrier between you and the highway in California. We have um, the White Cliffs of Dover, which has got a new resonance now, even since you painted them, in terms of migration. When I was growing up, the White Cliffs of Dover meant dogfights over the channel with Spitfires and Messerschmitts and, and, and a sort of jingoistic um, sentimental Britishness. And now, of course, it's become a, a contested space. Um, with protests on the streets of Dover against migrants. And here you have this, in a way, very loaded and potent subject dealt with in a few strokes. What, what were you thinking about when you painted it? Was it the view? No, yes, that, was, that was right after the, the referendum, when uh, Britain decided to split with the EU. Me, as a believer, as an EU believer, it was not possible to imagine anyone would uh, leave. It's again about the European Union. It's not the uh, Commonwealth. It's not the economical uh, union. But this is for me something else. A certain idea of uh, open world. I have the feeling also that I, I grew up in post-war uh, reality. The European Union was uh, sort of a remedy. This is another border, isn't it? This painting. Yeah, but th th this is just a very strange situation. I mean, we were going by the train from Thailand to Laos. That's the that's the border. We are waiting there for uh, for the people to come to stamp our passports. And in one of the waiting rooms, there was this metal pipe, uh, 
and, uh, and shoes. The thing I love about this painting, actually, is the way you rendered cheap orange plastic. I would love one day to, to paint plastic just with these clear, bright colours. It looks as if it's been taken, a, a photograph from a flashlight. It has this weird instantaneousness. It sort of jump, jumps at you. I was thinking about this, this very classic um, still life, and I wanted to make a drawing of it. Something that is um, obsolete, but then I liked the drawing itself, and I decided to, to paint it. And in, with the masking tape roll and the book, you've got the circle and the square, and, yes. and, and you've got all these kind of lovely references to quiet days in the studio, presumably. I'm painting what is close to hand. This is what I love about the studio, uh, that it's quiet. Painting itself is, um, being a painter and spending time in the studio is the greatest job. I have a system. Recently, I, I picked up audiobooks that are read by Ksadr Yashinski. He's a Polish lector. And I painted also the portrait of him. He read the recordings of him with hundreds of books for the blind people. It started in the 70s. So still you can hear the, the tapes that are digitalized. So you can hear the, the sound is fading away. You're accompanied in the studio. There's a painting here of, of Ornette Coleman. Is he with you in the studio as well? He is as well, yeah. And of course he was, he was groundbreaking in all kinds of ways. He was changing the game and had great collaborators. But he never lost, he never lost his rootsiness. He allowed himself freedom to go where he wanted. I don't say it lightly, I see in your work too, you know, there's, there's a sense of how you're pushing, pushing things apart and then homing in again. Do you think there's a change of tenor, a change of mood when you, because I know you spent time in, in the west coast of America recently, and there are some paintings of highways, um, and it's the land of opportunity, but it doesn't feel that way, either reading the news or looking at these paintings. I have to change the, the palette, and of course, in a way, it's not an attractive city, but on the other hand, with its ugliness, I liked it very much. Certain things that are, that are very practical, but on the other hand, very inhuman. Yes, it was a very different experience, and I, I missed actually people on the streets. You've painted a lot of highways in your time. For me, it's the, it's the, it's the highlight of, of our civilization. Yeah, this is about uh, being in permanent mood. And the, the chain link being out of focus. Yeah. It's pushing us towards the horizon, isn't it? Yes, but I, but I like this, that it's so evident. It's taken from the photograph. One is very much aware of where, the, where you, the painter, is looking from. That was the because the studio that I had in LA. So I decided to paint also because of the vastness of, of the of the landscape. I wanted to try with the, with a big canvas, but it it comes from from the roller coaster. But I, also I was I was interested in this gesture, in, in something very simple that you may transfer to this big size. It's also the idea about the LA, about California and its history of abstract painting that I wanted to to try with it, because I, I, I've never done before the purely abstract. And those elements of abstraction, they're sneaking back in again. I think in my works there are always attempts to, to, to make something with abstract, with gesture, with something that, is, um, that is, doesn't belong to the photographic world. And it's also an abstraction, these gestures, they're in perspective. They seem to be in perspective with the window, and, and they're, they're, they're playing games with the surface of the canvas, yeah. and also with the illusion in the, yes. in the painting. Yeah. And it looks like your wife is contemplating this dichotomy. I was thinking at the beginning of, of putting these two paintings, that this one and the uh, green one, uh, together, because this is view from above. We're being played with in terms of where we are in, in the space, as well as the painter. Yeah. Yeah. themselves is always one of the, the great delights of what you do.